Today's lecture is on central banks. Uh, we already had a lecture, a few lectures ago, about banks. Uh, so, what are central banks? Well, today they're very special government banks that are responsible for the currency, uh, the money. And so, every country in the world has a paper money that has the uh, name of their central bank on it. But I wanted to take the, as you know, I like to understand origins of things, and I wanted to take it back to the beginnings of central banking, so we'll uh, understand better what the uh, institution is. And I, I wanted to bring up first the theme of this course, which is that financial innovation or invention is an important process that uh, is not unlike uh, engineering invention. When somebody gets an idea and it's proven to work, it gets copied all over the world. That's the way uh, the human species is. We all have the same kind of cars, we all have the same kind of airplanes. Why? Be not because we're copycats, but because someone has figured out something that works, and of course everyone copies it. And I think the same thing is true with uh, central banks. So I wanted to get uh, to the history <coughs> of central banks and to go back first to the first central bank. Then I'll bring it all the way up to the modern times where the uh, recent financial crisis, the actions during the crisis, the actions of the world's central banks was extremely important in preventing what might have been another Great Depression. Uh, so these institutions have become of fundamental importance. So, uh, remember the story I told you in our banking lecture about how banks got started in the UK? Uh, they'd already been seen earlier in other places, but the, the really modern banking institution is traced to the goldsmith bankers. Okay, so people used to, there were goldsmiths who made gold jewelry, and people uh, found that since they had a safe or they had a way of protecting things, they would leave their gold on deposit at the goldsmith banker. And the goldsmith banker would give you a little piece of paper indicating that you could, any time, come back to the, to the goldsmith and claim this amount of gold. And then the pieces of paper started circulating as paper money. And that's how it all started. Unregulated, not, nothing to do with the government, it was just private businesses. Uh, and that system, paper money backed by gold, lasted until the 1970s. Amazing. Long, well, it wasn't always gold, it was bimetallic, it, you know, there would be gold and silver and things, or all silver, it's a long story, but the, uh, we were effectively on the gold standard until just a few decades ago. Uh, but there were problems <laughs> right from the beginning, and the problem was that sometimes the goldsmith bankers wouldn't make good <laughs> on their <laughs> pledge to redeem in gold. You'd come with your piece of paper and they'd say, I've gotten too many requests, I don't have any gold anymore. And so that was the, the problem. Uh, so I wanted to start with the, the Bank of England, uh, which uh, was founded in 1694. And it was just a bank, uh, but it had a special charter from the, the Parliament, uh, from the of the British government that gave it a monopoly on joint stock banking to start with. It would be the only bank in the United Kingdom that was allowed to issue shares and sell shares to a large number of people. There were other banks, but they were partnerships and it had only a limited number of uh, partners, so they didn't get as big. So the Bank of England became the dominant bank in the United Kingdom. and. Uh, it started a practice, and this is very important historically. Of, uh, it realized it had a lot of power because it was the, the, the guerrilla bank and there were a lot of little banks. And they realized soon that they could put any bank they wanted out of business whenever they felt like it. How? Well, because the Bank of England was so big, they got the, a lot of notes issued by these other banks. So anytime they wanted to, they could just present them all for payment. And no bank could withstand that. They didn't have enough gold on hand. So they, they could drive any bank to bankruptcy. Uh, 
But the Bank of England began to assume its role as a, essentially a government bank without being officially government by l l using a let, let's live and let live policy under one condition. If you are another bank in the UK, you have to keep a deposit with us, okay? And uh, the Bank of England would tell you how much. If you didn't do that, you could be destroyed. But that created a stability to the system because the Bank of England had money to bail them out whenever they, you know, they had a deposit with the Bank of England. The Bank of England required that. And so whenever a bank got in trouble, they could always take their money out of the Bank of England. So the Bank of England then would help these banks in return for their keeping a deposit, sometimes even lend more money to them. So that created a stable banking system over the centuries. So that was the model for all of the central banks of the world. They're all copies of the Bank of England. The Bank of England, by the way, was not an independent, it became a government bank. I don't know the whole history, but it wasn't really independent of the government until 1997 when the, uh, the United Kingdom made it formally independent. But nonetheless, it was a model for central banking. And it was observed over uh, much of the world. Uh, notably, in the United States, there was a bank called the Suffolk Bank. This is much later. Uh, it was founded in uh, 1819 in Boston. And it was a private bank, and on its own, it just decided to do the same thing that the Bank of England did. It required that all of the New England banks kept a deposit with it. And it did the same thing, and it stabilized New England from bank runs. Uh, and it lasted, uh, it, it, the, the Suffolk system lasted until 1860. Uh, so you can see how central banks are uh, inventions of people. They, they, they weren't government inventions at all. The Suffolk Bank just did this. It became a big and influential bank. And uh, the uh, United States, in the early, the first half of the 19th century, had repeated banking crises, and there were repeated problems with the currency. It used to be that if you went to a store, uh, and you wanted to buy something, they'd say, let's see your money. <laughs> you'd take out all of your money, you'd lay it down, and they'd look at it, and they'd say, well, this is Boston money, this is New Haven money, this is Hartford money. And they would pull out a book called The Banknote Reporter, and they'd say, well, our money dealers are now doing a 20% discount on Hartford money, so I'll give you 80 cents on the dollar for the Hartford money. Boston money, we're down 30% on that. What a, what a messy system. Uh, I shouldn't mention Boston, because Boston had a good record because of the Suffolk Bank. So, in other states, it was worse in other states, further you got from Boston. So the Suffolk Bank became held up as a model uh, of a banking system. But the US, the U.S. also had two banks, one called the Bank of the United States, which was founded in um, I'm forgetting the year, it's not in my notes. 17, anyone tell me when was the Bank of the United States founded? 1789, I think. Uh, and then we had a second Bank of the United States, but they weren't really functioning like the Bank of England. Uh, they were maybe somewhat like them, but the, 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 the banks of the United States were not really central banks, and they were not renewed. They disappeared in 1836. But the big movement in the United States, I, I, there was a lot of, because the United States didn't want the government involved in private business, they were reluctant to set up a central bank for a long time. Uh, in 1863, the U.S. passed the National Banking Act. Actually, there was a, a revision of it in 1864, um, and they, they, they tried to get some of the advantages of uh, these central banks without actually founding one. So what they did then is they said there's a new kind of bank called a national bank, and the national bank uh, would have a name like the uh, first national bank of New Haven. Every city created a bank 
1863, which was called the First National Bank of something. Uh, and the government required that they keep on deposit with the Treasury capital to, bank, to back their currency. So they were called national bank notes, okay, that were issued by the banks, printed by the government, but and they all looked the same, except they had a different name of the different bank on them. Uh, and they had capital requirements. So the banks had to put deposits with the Treasury backing their currency. Uh, and uh, that was a success. The United States never again had a problem with its paper money. Uh, it's always, uh, there was never a problem of discounts anymore. All the national banks would honor each other's notes at par. And so that's when the United States had a paper money for the first time. Uh, but it didn't create a, uh, a system of, um, of, uh, of stable currency. Uh, there were still banking crises, but they had a different form. It wasn't a failure of the banknotes. We fixed the banknote problem in 1863. But the problem was there were still runs on banks, and there were still credit expansions and contractions <coughs> that uh, led eventually to people in the United States thinking, we've got to eventually copy the Bank of England and do the same thing here. Uh, there was a terrible banking crisis in 1893, for example, when everybody thought the banks were going to fail. Somehow they didn't worry about the currency. The national bank notes were thought to be perfectly safe. But they thought the banks weren't safe, and so there was a crisis. And it led to the depression of the 1890s. Um, and uh, then there was another one in 1907 that was really bad. And so people wanted to fix somehow the system. And um, so that led to our current system, which has been around almost 100 years. And I call it a copy of the Bank of England, but that might not be described that way by everyone. And it's called the Federal Reserve System. All right. And that was created by an act of Congress in 1913. And it opened its doors in 1914. But the U.S., again, we always feel that we're different. I mean, we have to make it look different. We can't just copy the Bank of England. We've got to do something different. So they said, why don't we create 12 banks? That sounds more American, and have them all over the country. Uh, and so we didn't create a central bank. We have a banking system with 12 Federal Reserve banks. Uh, and, but of course, they decided to have a headquarters in Washington, D.C. called the Federal Reserve Board, okay? So the, or the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System uh, is an agency in Washington that oversees the 12 regional banks. Okay, do you know what region, which, uh, the country is divided up. What region are we in? It's Boston. This is the Boston region. So <coughs> most of the money in your pocket is Boston money. Uh, it only says so now on the $1 bills, I think, but you can look and see whether, uh, where your money came from, which of the 12 banks, uh, your currency. Um, but the Federal Reserve System, as founded in 1913, required, th just like the Bank of England, that uh, banks have deposits, or uh, e either currency in their vault, or deposits with, the, uh, with their uh, Federal Reserve Bank to back up their currency. And once again, if they got into trouble, they could draw on their deposits with the Federal Reserve. Or even beyond that, the Federal Reserve could come to their rescue. They're, they've been good banks. They've kept their deposits, just like uh, under the Suffolk system. They've kept their deposits with the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve will then <laughs> help them a little bit more. Uh, and so uh, it became known as the lender of last resort. Uh, and 
the system also uh, operated something called the discount window. Now, wh why do they call it a window? And wh what this is? When you, uh, you, you people never go into a bank anymore, right? Or do you go into banks? Remember, they used to have a teller, and the teller would be sitting at a sort of a table, and there's a little something. He's talking to you through a window. I guess they wanted to keep you separate from the money, so <laughs> there was a window where a teller would talk to you. So uh, the discount window was a special window at the Federal Reserve Bank for banks to come. Just like every, this is the metaphor anyway. I don't know if they ever had such a window. And so uh, the, the bank that was in trouble could go to the discount window and uh, has to bring something, though. They have to bring some securities as collateral. And so uh, the, the teller behind the discount window would discount the, um, the collateral brought by the bank and lend money. So it's called a discount window because you couldn't just borrow money. You had to bring some asset as collateral for the loan. Uh, and uh, so uh, in 1913, when the Federal Reserve was founded, President Wilson, who was president who signed the bill, was almost ecstatic. I, I, I have a quote from him. I don't remember exactly, but something like, we have put banking crises behind us forever, and this will lead to a system of prosperity, and <laughs> I can't think of all the nice words he used. People thought that now that we have adopted the British system, uh, it ought to be smooth and uh, just like in Britain, it shouldn't be a, there shouldn't be a problem anymore. Uh, and so uh, we still live with that system today. Uh, I think Wilson was right. It was a big step forward. Uh, and uh, again, I, you know, it, it was a copying of other people's successes. Nobody knows exactly how the banking system worked. There's a theory of money in banking, but it, it has worked in practice. Uh, and so central bankers start to become very important in modern society because they, they are really the keepers of the gate of the of sensible lending. There is a tendency for banking systems to overlend, to create booms, uh, and uh, create a, a, prosper a false prosperity for a while, and then it crashes, and we have a banking panic and a recession or a depression. So um, uh, that means then uh, the, the banking system has to be the source of stability and good sense. So we would tend to recruit as central bankers people who are moral <laughs> and stable in their lives. And, uh, so it was uh, one of our uh, Federal Reserve Chairs, William McChesney Martin, said, summed it up very nicely, the job of the central banker is to take away the punch bowl as soon as the party gets going. <laughs> okay. It's like a parent, right? <laughs> Taking away. You can have one drink, but we're going to stop. Um, and so that's what the central bank. See, what, the, the central bank controls the system through uh, reserve requirements. That is, how, uh, by telling the banks who are members of the system how much they have to hold in reserves, which are deposits at the central bank or currency. If they hold currency in their vaults, if it's right there, then they're OK. Um, this term, reserve requirement, actually goes back to uh, before the Federal Reserve, because we had state, in the United States, we had state banking regulators that were already imposing reserve requirements. And I, I haven't tracked down exactly when it began, but I think probably around 1900 in the United States, during the Progressive Era. Uh, and uh, so, uh, there are also capital requirements. 
And uh, I'll come back to making a distinction uh, between the two. Uh, capital requirements and reserve requirements, both of those terms began to flourish around 1900, even before the Federal Reserve, uh, with state banking regulators who were requiring uh, both capital and reserves in the United States. Uh, I don't know the history of every other country. Uh, but as the Fed after the Federal Reserve was set up in 1913, it began to take over both of these uh, functions of setting reserve requirements and setting uh, capital requirements. Uh, let me go a little forward in history. The, the, uh, the system appeared great. We had the Federal Reserve. We had now every country of the world, not just the U.S. and the U.K., virtually every country of the world had a central bank. Uh, even the communist countries, I think, had central banks. Uh, but uh, uh, the uh, system broke down in 1933. Well, actually, before 33, after 1929, uh, banks started to fail. Uh, and uh, the Federal Reserve uh, could have bailed out the banks. Uh, in the United States, they started to fail, not the United Kingdom, but there was a banking crisis uh, after 1929, and it reached its peak in 1933. Um, so just before President Roosevelt took office, uh, the banks were in total disarray. And the first thing Roosevelt did as president was to shut down the entire banking system of the United States. It was called the banking holiday, because Everyone was running to the bank. It was a, a catastrophic bank run. Everyone was failing at once. And it was, a, it was quite a scary situation because nobody could get at their money. The, the banks were all closed, all of them. And uh, people started to run out of money. Uh, I remember the, uh, was it the Harvard Crimson did a poll of its students asking them, how much money do you have in your pocket? And it got down to like 10 cents and 5 cents. <laughs> they just spent all their money. What do you do? I mean, how can, how can you get lunch? Well, I assume they had a cafeteria. Somehow you could still do it. You couldn't go anywhere and spend any money if you didn't have it, because it was all tied up. So people started changing IOUs, and it was just a mess. Uh, so uh, uh, the uh, Federal Reserve didn't stop that crisis. Uh, but uh, uh, the R Roosevelt administration did other things to prevent crises like this, notably set up the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Now, this was a deposit insurance had preceded uh, the FDIC uh, in 1933, but it uh, had never been a success. It had been tried in a number of places. Uh, the U.S., I think, set the example for deposit insurance. And that began to augment uh, central banking. Uh, the U.S. had not had another banking crisis since 1933 until um, 2007, <laughs> just recently. And, uh, well, I should say, there was the saving and loan crisis, but not a big banking crisis. Uh, and uh, that is testimony to, I think, the importance of deposit insurance. But the, um, the Federal Reserve began to see its role as not so much preventing banking crises, that was always in the background, but as stabilizing the economy. And so uh, the Fed began to think of itself as preventing the recurrence of recessions. So when the economy was overheating, the uh, uh, inflation was building up. The Fed would raise interest rates, and the higher interest rates would uh, cool down the economy. And when the uh, economy got too soft, when the unemployment rate went up, the Fed uh, would cut interest rates, and that would uh, encourage borrowing, encourage spending, and, and boost the economy. Actually, that that function of the Fed goes back even before 
1933. There was an economist, uh, Charles Amos Dice, who wrote in the 1920s that uh, the Federal Reserve is like the regulator on a steam engine. Do you know a steam? Do you know anything about steam engines? They have this thing that whirls around with two little weights. And if the steam engine gets too fast, the weights spin out by centrifugal force, and it cuts off the steam so that it doesn't, doesn't overheat. The engine doesn't get going too fast. And so Dice said, the Federal Reserve is an invention. Now that is serving a different, it's the regulator for the whole economy. Um, and I think he was right, although it's not as accurate as a, um, as a uh, regulator on a steam engine, but it works. Uh, Somewhat well. I wanted to mention uh, that there's every country now has a central bank, but I just wanted to mention the uh, European Central Bank because it's quite new and uh, 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 it's quite new and it's uh, maybe the biggest central bank now uh, in the sense that it, uh, well, I shouldn't say that. In terms of, it might be the biggest central bank by some standard. Uh, in, uh, there was a treaty signed at Maastricht uh, in 1992, um, which uh, uh, led to the creation of the European Union from the European communities. And it also created a plan for a new currency uh, called the Euro, which is a European currency. Uh, and uh, the um, Euro did not actually start until um, 1999, and the currency, actual currency, was not issued until 2002. So uh, that is a, a relatively recent uh, invention. The European Central Bank, or ECB, was founded in 1998. That's before the euro currency started. Uh, they created a uh, list of countries that wanted to participate in the eurozone. Uh, the eurozone. Not all European Union countries decided to participate in the euro. Notably, the United Kingdom had a referendum and voted against it. And to this day, they are not members of the euro. Also, uh, Sweden. Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Poland, Czech Republic, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, and Malta are not in the Eurozone. Uh, some of these countries that are not officially in the Eurozone use the Euro unofficially. It's not their currency, but there's no law against your coming in and spending Euros, so the Euro seems more uh, distributed than, uh, than that. So. Uh, so anyway, that, that's the most uh, recent central bank, but it's the same general structure as every European country has its own central bank, uh, like the Banca d'Italia or the Deutsche Bundesbank, but their original purpose is kind of gone because they no longer maintain a currency. There are no more Deutschmarks or uh, Italian lira. They're all using the euro. Uh, so the real central bank is the. Uh, the European Central Bank in Frankfurt, um, led by uh, Jean-Claude Trichet, uh, right now. So, Bank of Japan, by the way, was uh, uh, became independent. Independent. Mentioned that in 1997. Bank of Japan, another very important central bank. There's been a movement in the last few decades to make central banks independent. This was something that our own Federal Reserve had from the beginning. It was designed to be separate from the government. The reason was they thought that a government might want to inflate the currency. Political pressures might, at certain times, cause them to try to influence the central bank. And so uh, the Federal Reserve was set up so that uh, the members of the Board of Governors had 14-year terms. They couldn't be kicked out except for uh, impeachment uh, offenses, uh, and so the government couldn't control the central bank. 
the independent central bank has been very important. What, what tends to happen is you bring people in who've had long careers in banking, who have a reputation for integrity, and you tell them that you are the custodian of the currency. You bring in people who believe in the importance of a stable currency, and then you give them a 14 year term, um, and they're there. It's like the Supreme Court almost. You can't kick them out. And uh, uh, some people think that's why the U.S. has had such a stable price level, because of our independent central bank. So many countries have fallen into inflation uh, that has undermined the currency, but the U.S. hasn't. And I think that's why the, there has been a move to copy the independent central bank. Uh, uh, so, um, okay, now uh, I wanted to talk now about specifics of what the central bank does. Uh, n notably, the Federal Reserve System has a committee uh, called the Federal Open Markets Committee, FOMC, Federal Open Markets Committee, that meets around once a month. And, the most, and they issue a statement every time they meet. And the, uh, as it is now, it, uh, actually FOMC doesn't go back to 1913, but I'm talking about the Federal Reserve as it is now. This committee decides on a range for an interest rate called the federal funds rate. And the federal funds rate is an overnight interest rate that is done be that is charged on loans between banks and some other financial institution. You generally would not have access to the federal funds rate. Now, you probably don't need it because you don't need an overnight loan anyway, right? <laughs> Most of us would borrow money for more than one night. Uh, but banks, for various reasons, uh, do this lending and borrowing every day, uh, at, at least under normal circumstances. So we have an overnight interest rate, okay? Uh, there's also longer federal funds, but we're emphasizing the overnight rate. And it's unsecured. This is just an unsecured, there's no collateral. It's an unsecured loan between banks. So the interest rate reflects some risk, negligible risk usually, because banks trust each other at least overnight, <laughs> right? They know pretty much they're going to get paid back. Uh, and uh, the current federal funds rate in the United States is 0.13% as of uh, last Friday. That's 13 basis points, so it's virtually zero. Uh, this is a policy decision of the Federal Open Markets Committee. They have decided that the range for the federal funds rate will be between zero and 25 basis points. So it, uh, as of last Friday, was exactly in the middle of their range. The, the FOMC uses its decisions to set the federal funds rate as a way of stabilizing the economy. This is the regulator that uh, Dice talked about. Right now, they've set it virtually at zero because the economy is so weak. The unemployment rate last week was 8.8 percent, extremely high. And so, uh, the Federal Reserve is not worried about inflation now. It's worried about high unemployment. And it's pushed it about as close to zero as it can get it. Uh, it can't go below zero because you can't have negative interest rates. No one would lend at a negative interest rate. So, uh, uh, that's... Uh, where we are. Um, and now, I wanted to just tell you about an interesting development that came in uh, just, uh, well, just in 2008. The uh, reserve, w I mentioned that banks hold reserve accounts at the Federal Reserve. Traditionally, those accounts were not interest-paying. I mean, you, 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 banks had to either hold money or, 
or, or an account at the Federal Reserve for their reserves. And neither of them pay interest, right? If you hold money, you don't get any interest. If you actually have currency in your vault, you don't get interest. And until recently, uh, banks didn't get interest on their deposits at the Federal Reserve. But that all changed in 2008 with the Emergency Econo Economic Stabilization Act that President George Bush signed, ESA as it's called. And ESA allowed the Federal Reserve to pay interest on the reserves held in the accounts at the Federal Reserve. Okay. So the Fed has a policy now of paying interest on reserve balances. You see what I'm saying? I don't know what the Suffolk Bank did or the Bank of England did, but I know what the Fed is doing now. If, if a member bank puts money in deposit with the Federal Reserve, they will get an interest rate. And you can find out what the interest rate is by going to the Federal Reserve website. And right now, it is 0.25%. And so uh, that's an important policy change because now it encourages the holding of reserves. Um, now, some people look at this and ask this question uh, Here's the federal funds rate. Why isn't it the same as the interest on reserves? Uh, interesting, uh, interesting question. Uh, why would anybody borrow? Uh, wh why would any bank invest in the federal funds market if they can get a higher interest rate by just holding a reserve at the Federal Reserve? Uh, there's been a lot of discussion of why that is. Now it's a new phenomenon because the, the the interest on reserves goes back only less than three years. Uh, I think the answer, the, the simplest answer to the question, is that. Uh, member banks of the Federal Reserve System have stopped lending on the federal funds market, basically. They, they just leave it in reserves uh, because that's a higher interest rate. <laughs> so who is lending at this? It turns out that there are some people, notably the government-sponsored enterprises like Fannie and Freddie, that are not eligible for interest on reserves. So they have taken over the federal funds market. Uh, the reason the Fed added interest on reserves is to create another tool of monetary policy. Uh, there's a lot of concern that after this crisis is over, there will be a sudden surge of inflation. And uh, let me uh, come back to that. Basically, what the Fed has a new tool is if that happens to raise the interest on reserves. Uh, or, uh, um, and that will help uh, contract the economy instantly, very rapidly. The way the, the Fed controls the federal funds rate, and has been doing for years, is by buying and selling treasury bills on the open market, by uh, affecting the supply and demand for short-term credit. And that indirectly, they don't actually deal in the federal funds market. They deal in the treasury bill market. But since those markets are interlinked, they indirectly target the federal funds rate. Uh, so that's the old way of trading in the federal funds market, not in the federal funds market, trading in the short term treasury market through the uh, New York Fed. But now they have a new tool. Uh, so we're entering a whole new regime of monetary policy. Okay, so I wanted to talk about. Um, uh, Reserve requirements a little bit more, and uh, uh, what what those are. Um, so the the Federal Reserve has the authority to set the amount of reserves that a bank holds. I wanted to make clear the distinction between reserve requirements and capital requirements. So. Okay, the, uh, the Federal Reserve has what's called Regulation D, 
which specifies how much banks have to hold as a function of their liabilities. And as of uh, right now, the reserve requirements are uh, 10% of transaction accounts. Okay, that means that a, a, a bank has to total up all of the transaction accounts, and that consists of checking accounts, uh, what, what, are, what are the um, now accounts, and ATS accounts. The, their transactions accounts are accounts like checks that people have a deposit in the bank that they'll use for spending, and those are instantly withdrawable. Okay. In contrast, there's something called time deposits. Those are savings accounts, and uh, the bank does not have to give you the money immediately. In other words, if you go to your checking account and say, I want my money, it's a transaction account, they have to give it to you instantly. That's the rule. But if you go to your saving account, they can stall. Because it's a, you might not have noticed it, but it's in the fine print somewhere. <coughs> this is a time deposit. So the Fed is not worried about time deposits. Uh, we're, here, we're talking about reserve requirements. Reserve requirements are still based on the old theory that we're trying to prevent bank runs. Okay, and so we don't want people to, we don't, don't want there to be a run on banks where people panic and try to withdraw their money all at once. So we want to make sure that banks have enough reserves. And the Fed currently thinks 10% ought to be enough. For time deposits, it's zero. You don't have to put any money on reserve for time deposits. And wh why does the Fed think that? Because you've got you know, 60, 90 days or a year to pay the person back. So they can't run on you. So we don't require any reserve requirements against time deposits. But it's 10% for a transactions account, which is substantial, because they're still worried about this. Okay, so this is the situation. Uh, we used to talk, emphasize in lectures about central banking, the so-called money multiplier. Okay, uh, the money multiplier. Uh, well, it's complicated, but the simplest thing is it might be one over the reserve requirement. It's not exactly that, but. If the reserve requirement is 10%, then the total amount of deposits that banks can issue is going to be 10 times the amount of currency and deposits they have at the Federal Reserve. So that means the reserve requirements would fix the money supply under the old theory, because uh, uh, if you know the, the, the high-powered money is the Currency plus deposits at the Federal Reserve, that's reserves. And if the reserve requirement is 10% and banks want to just meet that requirement and nothing more, they're going to have 10 times as much deposits, right, as there are reserves. So, uh, I'm oversimplifying the money multiplier. But I'm telling you that at the moment in history, it's irrelevant because banks are holding excess reserves. The world has changed. Just a few years ago, before this financial crisis, banks didn't want to hold excess reserves. And so there were hardly any excess reserves. Why? Because they don't get any interest on them, all right? And so banks don't hold excess, didn't hold excess reserves. So the money market multiplier theory would work because the amount of reserve was just about exactly equal to 10% of transactions account. I'm oversimplifying, but something like that was true. But now they're paying 25 basis points on reserves. So that's, that's a lot more than you can get investing in the federal funds market. So banks are just perfectly happy to hold excess reserves. So the excess reserves now are over, I think it's, what is it? it's 1.2 trillion. It's huge um, uh, because of interest on reserves. Uh, and uh, I don't have the exact number, but something has fundamentally changed 
in just the last few years. Uh, so reserve requirements, they, they must hold for some banks, but for most banks, they don't even look at reserve requirements anymore. <laughs> what, what do I care? I'm so happy to hold reserves. I, I, I don't, I'll, I'll hold way more than they require. So reserve requirements are non-binding for most banks now. Uh, so it's a different world. Uh, this brings us then to uh, capital requirements. So in the world, uh, history is always changing. The world, as of a few years ago, everyone emphasized reserve requirements, and those were the requirements uh, that had as its motive preventing bank runs. But we're not going to have a bank run now when these banks have a, over a trillion dollars just sitting there. Uh, they, they're holding so much that it's not an issue right now. So something else has taken the center stage, and that is capital requirements, which we talked about last time. So uh, capital requirements uh, are different from uh, re reserve requirements. I just defined re reserve requirements were a fraction of the transaction accounts. They were defined by a liability of the bank. A transaction account is like a checking account. It's some money that the bank owes to other people. And we have this uh, requirement that 10 percent of that uh, is, uh, is the reserve requirement. But capital requirements are different, uh, and they're more likely to be binding these days. Uh, and um, these were emphasized in Basel III, which we talked about uh, before. Uh, so, uh, Basel III is not yet in force. It's going to take a long time. We, Basel III has a um, phase in period that it's going to take until I think it's 2019. But there's a lot of talk now about trying to get. Uh, Basel III phased in. So remember, we talked about risk weighted assets. Uh, now it is banks have to hold uh, capital uh, as a fraction of their risk weighted assets. So right now, the countries of the world, they've agreed, the G20 countries have agreed on Basel III. But each country has to decide on the implementation of Basel III. The United States, in particular, is having problems with Basel III because uh, Basel III refers to credit ratings in many places. Uh, but Dodd Frank, the Dodd Frank Act, Uh, Act of 2010 abolishes credit ratings. The government will no longer make any use in any regulation of credit ratings. Remember what credit ratings are. Moody's and Standard & Poor's we have are, are the two best known credit rating agencies. The government, the SEC, starting in 1975, defined what they called NRSROs. <coughs> That's nationally recognized statistical rating organization. <laughs> All right? And that included Moody's, which was founded in 19, about 1900, and Standard & Poor's, which uh, was a result of uh, the merger of Standard Statistical Association and Poor's uh, a little bit after 1900. They're venerable old institutions that give a risk rating for securities. For example, Moody's will give its best securities a triple A rating. Okay? That means Moody's thinks they'll never default. Yale University is rated triple A <laughs> by Moody's, for example. Uh, but they go, if they don't like you quite as much, they'll downrate you to double A. Or if they don't like you even more, you're only A, 
and then, God forbid, you go down into the bees. It's like, in fact, Moody, uh, John Moody in his book acknowledges that it was just, he, he took the same grading system that he got in college. I don't know why, it's, not, it's a little different. You don't get a triple A grade here, do you? I've never given a triple A. <laughs> but that's how Moody saw it, and so it survives like letter grades to securities. Well, Moody did that in 1900, and if you read his autobi autobiography, people said, you're crazy, how can you give a grade to a security? It seemed like a wild idea, but he stuck with it, and over the years, people began to believe in them more and more. So it led to an idea that we fully understand the risk of securities. And so there was a set of a, a complacency set in. And the government started to recognize these NRSROs as if they were proclaimers of God's truth. Uh, and they started all kinds of regulations, said what your capital had to be depending on the rating of, uh, of various assets you hold. But the whole thing collapsed in the recent financial crisis because some AAA securities lost almost everything. So the rating agencies made a big problem issue. Uh, and so Congress has now said nobody can re make any regulation based on N uh, ratings of the NRSROs. Uh, but Basel III people didn't get the message. Well, they're not America, they're international, and they still believe in them. I think it's a little bit difficult to know how to um, handle risk. This is the fundamental problem. And it, it would be nice if, we, if Moody's and S&P could tell us, but the problem is that they missed this whole crisis. They didn't see it coming. And why didn't they? Well, that's a deep issue, but that's what people are wrestling with right now. So the U.S. has to figure out what to do to reinterpret the Basel III recommendations for the United States without using any reference to Moody's and S&P. What will probably happen, I think, is that uh, the banks will have to have their own risk committees, and they will have to come up with their own assessments of risk, and they'll be responsible for those. But what will really happen is they'll just look at the Moody's and S&P ratings, <laughs> and it'll, it'll be rubber stamping them. So I don't think that, th th there's a whole question whether Dodd-Frank will be effective in reducing our requirement. Uh, but I wanted to go over the capital requirements uh, once again, because now they're increasingly important. And I wanted uh, to go through just a simple example of capital requirements so that you'll understand them. I, uh, uh, and I don't think that many, the general public understands them very well at all. Okay. And uh, so uh, this is old uh, accounting or old finance. But these requirements go back 100 years. I'm going to talk in very simple terms about them. Oversimplifying. Basel III is a complicated uh, new agreement. It has a lot of ins and outs. But I'm just going to oversimplify it and talk about the Basel III common equity requirements. Uh, that uh, I'm going to tell a little story about founding a bank. Okay, And let's just understand how capital requirements work. So imagine that you decided to found a bank. Okay, uh, In uh, developed countries of the world today, you can do this. You can set up your own bank. The, problem, the only problem you have, you have to get a charter. You have to apply for a charter. You have to decide whether you're a national bank in the United States or some other kind of bank. But you get a charter, and you open your doors. Now, you've got to start complying with capital requirements. But uh, um, let's say you do that, all right? You find that there's an empty bank building downtown, all right? You rent the building, you, get the, you go through the paperwork, and you set up your bank, and you open the doors, and now we have, uh, we have one of those windows with a teller and inviting deposits, okay? So uh, I'm going to tell a story which is oversimplified and maybe a little bit. Uh, let's say that uh, you um, open your doors, and someone walks in with $100 and deposits it, all right? Uh, so this is your bank, or I'll say my bank. Okay. Uh, the bank had. Now you probably, I think regulators would require you come up with some capital first. But I'm going to tell the story 
it, it seems to be a nicer story. You start out with deposits. Assume your regulators allowed you to start. So somebody walks in and deposits, and here's your assets, and here's your liabilities. Okay? Left side is assets, right side is liabilities. So someone deposits $100 in cash to your bank. All right? So you've got an asset now of $100. Okay? And you have a liability now of $100. If that's a savings account, you don't have any reserve requirements. Uh, if it's a transactions account, you have to hold $10. I've got it, right? I've got $100 sitting in my vault, because the guy just gave me $100. So I'm satisfying both my reserve requirements and my, now am I satisfying my capital requirements? Well, I have to calculate risk-weighted assets, all right? Remember, every kind of asset has its risk. What about cash? Well, cash has a zero risk, so it has a zero risk weighting. So right now, my risk weighted assets equals z zero. Okay. Uh, now, okay, I've got to satisfy all the regulations that are on me, and I, I'm satisfying my reserve requirements. Right? I've got my reserve. I've got a hundred dollars. This is cash in my safe. And this is a liability uh, that I owe uh, $100 in the form of a, uh, let's say it's a transaction account. Whenever this person comes back, I've got to pay $100. Okay. My, all right, so my reserve requirements are satisfied because I've got more than 10% of my transactions account. My risk weighted assets are zero. Now, Basel III says that you have to hold 4.5% of your risk-weighted assets as uh, capital. But now, wait a minute, I have a problem. <laughs> okay. What is my capital here? I don't have any capital. I've just opened my doors, and I've, uh, I've got $100 in assets, $100 in liabilities. Everything looks OK from reserve requirement, but there's no capital. Uh, so what is capital? Well, I, I have to issue shares uh, to come up with capital, and uh, I'm going to need four point. It, what it, it, Basel III says: four point five percent common equity requirement. And they also have something called a, a capital conservation buffer, which is another two point five percent. Uh, plus 2.5 percent, which you don't absolutely have to hold, but if you don't hold it, you're subject to restriction. So I'm going to add these. This is the capital conservation buffer. I've got to hold 7 percent under Basel III, and I don't have any capital here. All right. Uh, so what do I do? I'm not in compliance, so I've got to do. So. I've got to raise capital. Uh, so what I can do is I can issue shares. Uh, I have to find, I sell shares in the business. So all I need to do is sell uh, seven, uh, well, okay, what would it be? Uh, let, let's say I put in, I issue $20 in shares. Okay? Uh, and then that means someone gives me more cash, right? Because someone paid for the shares. Uh, so I've now got $120. Well, I add another plus 20. So it's a total uh, assets of 120, all held in cash. Okay, now I've got. Uh, now this is not a different kind of liability. It, this is common equity. And the regulators make a big distinction between this kind of liability. The transaction account and this kind of liability, the twenty dollars. Why do they make a big distinction? Because this guy can come to the window any time, and you've got to give them a hundred dollars whenever this person asks. The shareholders have no demand on you at all; they own a share of the company. You don't; they can't come to the window and demand anything. You can just send them away. The only deal you have with shareholders is that all shareholders will receive an equal dividend if the board of directors decides to vote dividend. They're shareholders in the company. 
but they can't run the bank. The shareholders can't show up at the window, so there's no risk of bank runs for them. And there's no risk of problems, because if anything goes bad, you just tell the common equity guys, you're out, you lost. Okay, so now what are my risk-weighted assets? They're still zero. I've got $120 in cash, zero. I don't have any, uh, 7% times zero is zero. So now I'm in great shape. I've satisfied both my reserve requirements and I've satisfied my Basel III capital requirements. Uh, okay, now, so what do we do next? Uh, we created a bank uh, and there's no interest paid on these checking accounts, and we're not earning any interest. We've got a bank and we're satisfying the requirements, but nobody's making any money, so we've got to do something to make money. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, let's say we get our board of directors meeting. A board of directors elected by the common equity shareholders, and we decide, let's uh, make some corporate loans. So why don't we lend out all of this $100 that was cash, and lend it to some business as a corporate loan, and we'll charge them interest. Now we're going to start making money. So this is no longer cash in safe. This is corporate loans. Loans to corporations to do business. All right. So there we are. Uh, our balance sheet ba balances. Everything looks fine. But what is our risk-weighted asset now? Well, you remember, corporate loans get a 100% risk weight because under Basel, uh, uh, going back to Basel I, they always thought corporate loans are risky assets. So my risk weighted assets are now $100, okay? And 7% of $100 is $7. So, hey, I'm doing fine. Now we're capitalized enough, we're in business. We're satisfying both our reserve requirements. Reserve requirements being 10%, and that's only $12, and we've got it in cash, and uh, we're satisfying our Basel III re capital requirements. So everything is fine. Uh, everything is fine, and, and we're, we're in business. And we're not done yet, because uh, our risk weighted assets are, are, are $7 is the capital requirement, and we've got $20 in common equity. Okay. So everything is great, and this is fine. But now let's go on. Now there's a, a crisis, all right? Business gets bad. So the next thing that happens is 20% of my corporate loans default, okay? And so we then, uh, you know, we, it becomes clear. We have another board meeting, and someone says, I have bad news. We made $100 in corporate loans, but these guys, $20 is never going to get paid back. The, the borrower is out of business. So I suggest we do a write off of our corporate loans, and let's reduce them to $80, okay? So what happens? Now, assets have to equal liabilities. $100 is our assets now, not $120, right? Because we just lost $20. Our liabilities can't be $120, because they have to equal our assets. What gives? Well, it's the shareholders that give, so we mark down common equity to zero, and now assets and liabilities match. So now let's look at our requirements. What about our reserve requirements? Reserve requirements are fine. We're holding excess reserves. You know, we only have to hold $10, and we've got $20 in cash, but we're no longer satisfying our capital requirements. So our bank regulator is going to shut us down unless we do something to raise capital. So how do we raise capital? That's the next step. Well, one thing we could do is um, we could sell some of our corporate loans, right? Uh, we could find a buyer for our corporate loans, and we could sell, say, $20 worth of them, bring this down to 60, and this would go up to 40, all right? Our risk-weighted assets would now well, then, let me see. No, that wouldn't do it. I'm sorry, that wouldn't do it, would it? We'd still have, <laughs> we still don't have, I'm sorry, I misspoke. We still don't have any, uh, any common equity. We, in this case, if we don't have any common equity, we can't get out of this by selling our loans. We could have if it didn't reduce it to zero. If the common equity went down to $10, 
then I could sell some of my corporate loans to get out of this mess, right? But I've made it zero, so the only way out that I can do is to issue more shares. So I've got to go to my friends again and say, well, we started this bank, but we goofed up. We made bad loans, and so we, we've, we've exhausted our common equity. I've got to raise more, uh, more, uh, more capital now. And so what you could do is get more friends to come in. Now, they might not want to do it because the previous friends just got wiped out. They lost everything, right? But you're coming in as new shareholders uh, on top of the old. Uh, and you, you could then raise, go back to where you were before by just issuing more shares. Uh, so this is the system. Uh, I think I've pretty much summarized it. It's, uh, it's simple. Now, the, the issue is, however, that what, what motivated Basel III was that the, this system of requiring banks to hold capital is supposed to stabilize the system. If they've got enough common equity, the bank won't go bankrupt even if they lose some of their corporate loans. It would be a big disaster to drive them to, to insolvency. Uh, but the, uh, the problem is that the system they set up has banks responding to a crisis by selling corporate loans or selling, issuing new shares. The problem is both of those are hard to do in a crisis. In a crisis, you know, and everything's falling apart, you go out saying, I want to issue new shares in my bank that just lost everything. <laughs> the investors are going to say, you've got to be kidding. I'm not going to invest in you right now. So you can't raise new equity. Okay, what about selling loans? Well, the problem is, in a big national cri or international crisis, every bank on the planet is trying to sell its loans at the same time. So it creates a collapse in the system. And this is what happened in the financial crisis. This story repeated a million times was banks were trying to raise capital and they were trying to sell assets either by issuing, they were trying to raise capital either by issuing shares or by selling assets. And everyone doing it at the same time created a crunch. And the whole system would have collapsed if it weren't for the central banks. The central banks of the world responded quickly by uh, loans, uh, loans to companies to banks and other companies. So the lender of last resort saved the whole system from collapsing. That's the story of the financial crisis. Uh, the remaining story is the Basel III people in Switzerland said, let's analyze how we got into this situation. How did it get so bad? And they thought, you know, it's kind of a funny system because we're requiring banks to raise capital at the worst time. And that can't be the right system. Uh, and they looked around and tried to decide what to do better. It, most countries of the world were following this kind of system. There were some, uh, some people were impressed by the government of Spain having a better system. But the Spanish banking system collapsed anyway, so it, it, didn't, uh, it didn't solve the problem. So Basel III came up with um, a, uh, a, a solution which was to allow the central regulators to add another buffer uh, of 2.5 percent uh, if they think there's a bubble going on. They would do this before the crisis, and that raises the uh, common equity requirement to 9.5 percent. So the idea is this is going to be a problem. Raising capital at a time of, of difficulty is always going to be a problem. Uh, and we can always rely again on our central banks, but maybe we can't. Uh, maybe we shouldn't. And so the idea is let's take bank regulators and make it their obligation to raise capital requirements in advance when they see a bubble coming. Now, another thing that happened in the United States is the Dodd-Frank Act of 2010 uh, because of intense public reaction to all the bailouts said that the, the, the Federal Reserve can no longer use discretion in deciding who to bail out. 
They can operate a discount window, but it has to be completely fair and even for every They can't decide, we're going to bail out Bear Stearns and we're going to let Lehman Brothers fail. Uh, all they can do is operate a consistent discount window. So we're c- the, the, they've constrained, the Dodd-Frank Act constrained the central bank in the United States from exercising the kind of judgment that saved us from the crisis. And we're going to have to rely on some different things, like better capital standards, like uh, Basel III, uh, to, uh, to fix the situation. We're, whether we're there or not is going to be a big question. This is a complicated system, and we put a lot of the best minds into trying to figure out how to prevent the kind of instability that we're seeing in this example where everyone is short on capital at the same time, everyone is selling loans at the same time, and the whole system collapses. We've come up with different solutions, and, but they have to be implemented yet, and there are problems of implementation. Uh, the, the, the role of central banks and of regulatory authorities are evolving and changing, and it'll be a period of many years before we know where this system is actually going. All right, I will stop here. Next, uh, next lecture is with on investment banking, and uh, we have a former Econ 252 student, Jan Fugner, who is back after nine years, and he will tell us about his experiences as an investment banker, and also a Facebook uh, executive.